Welcome to 2020 Politics War Room with James Carville. I'm Al Hunt here in Washington. James is out in the Shenandoah. We're proud partners with Sign Institute and American University. And once again, we have a great show this week. But first, please subscribe to 2020 Politics War Room on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcast. James, the COVID pandemic has now infected over a million Americans, more deaths than we experienced during the entire Vietnam War. It affects every element of American society and the economy. You know, later we're gonna hear from the great sports author, John Feinstein on the impact on American athletics. But first we are so pleased to welcome Drew Faust, the former president of Harvard University and author of the acclaimed Brilliant, The Republic of Suffering, The Staggering Challenges of Death During the Civil War. Drew, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks so much for having me. We want to talk uh, about the analogies and lessons of the earlier suffering. I know James has told me it's one of the great books he's ever read in his life. Oh, thank you, James. But first, put on your higher education cap for a minute. Every college in America now must be sitting around. Every college president must be uh, going through great anxiety, devising options for the fall. Some like Purdue and Brown say they'll have an on-campus semester. Others talk about more limited options. If this pandemic has subsided but not gone away and the possibility of a second surge remains, what do you see as the outlook for colleges and universities this fall? I think they need to be very careful as we see the summer unfold and see what the disease is doing and figure out what balance of face-to-face and distance learning uh, can be most effectively mounted. One of the issues, of course, is that spaces are going to be need are going to need to be transformed. I think the word has been used about college dormitories that they are like cruise ships because they're shared bathrooms, shared eating spaces. So how do we separate students more if we wish to bring them back safely? How do we arrange classrooms so that we can have more space in classrooms? Do we have multiple versions of a single course so that we can have smaller um, populations in, in rooms? How do we figure out the spaces on campus that we are going to use? Perhaps they'll have to be classes from dawn till all through the weekend in order to make maximum use of space. And then you think about the population of young people who have been less susceptible to the disease, but then you've got a lot of older people on campus too. And how do we think about keeping them safe? So there's so many challenges, but of course, a residential university experience has a big emphasis on residential. Having people together, having them bump into each other is a plus in higher education, but a minus, of course, in relationship to this disease. So it's very challenging to figure out how to keep everybody safe and still achieve the goals and purposes and values of of higher education. Well, I can see how you might be able to do it in the classroom. You know, I hate to bring this up with the uh, great Dr. Drew Faust, but James and I both teach a course, LSU and Penn, and we finished the semester or finishing the semester and it's worked, but uh, virtual teaching, uh, online teaching is not nearly as good as a classroom mm-hmm. experience. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, you can't have big lectures for sure. Uh, you're going to have to experiment maybe with fewer students, don't you think, in many places? I do. And so maybe have alternate um classes on campus, maybe not have everybody back, have some people back. There, I think there's so many options that I know lots of institutions are considering. And one of the things I found, I was teaching this spring as well, and I felt so grateful that I'd gotten to know the students before we all went online. Because online, I sustained the course, but I didn't get to know the students. I was building on my familiarity with them. So starting off with a course like the seminar I taught, I think would be very hard. One thing that my colleagues at Harvard and my successor, um, President Larry Bacow, have been emphasizing in the past weeks is that if we come back substantially online in the fall, we're going to have some courses that are meant to be online, that are designed especially for online capacities rather than courses that midstream switched from being face-to-face to to online. And so how can we use our expertise in things like edX over the past number of years to make an online experience that is the fullest 
uh, rendition of an online experience rather than a stopgap after a course had to go online. Drew, I'm going to turn this over to James uh, in just a second. But uh, the financial hit, it seems to me, no matter what, is going to be enormous. I've seen estimates of as high as $20 billion uh, in lost revenues. Harvard is going to be okay, and the other prestigious well-endowed schools will be. But small uh, colleges and and in cash-strapped states, they're going to be slashing funding for public institutions. I mean, higher education is likely to take a big hit uh, in this, isn't it? It's very worrying. And part of the glory of American higher education and its strength has been the diversity of institutions, that we have large research universities, both public and private, and then we have small colleges. I went to a small college. I know the importance of sustaining institutions like that, but they're going to all be under pressure. And I think, Al, one of the realities here is that there were enormous pressures on the business model of higher education before this virus and before this crisis. And the crisis has, as in so many other areas of American life, just exposed underlying challenges that now can't be avoided or pushed down the road. And so they're going to have to be some very difficult decisions that higher education will make in in the months and and years to come as it faces these financial pressures. Boy, James, uh, I know this is something you've been looking forward to. Go ahead. I have no, and I'm, as far as I'm coming to you from a part of the country, I think you have some familiarity with called the Shenandoah Valley. Is that where you are? Where are you, James? I'm in Morritown, Virginia. I'm between Woodstock and the Northern Valley. Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh. Well, I grew up near Front Royal, as you may know. Yeah, of course, in, when you're in Shenandoah County, you're never that far from the Civil War. Of course, I've walked Cedar Creek, mm-hmm. Sheridan County. Mm-hmm. But in, on a republic of suffering, because honestly, this topic is death, which seems to be something that we're talking a lot about today. As a beta background, tell us how prevalent death was in the Civil War. If, if, if we were experiencing this kind of carnage, today with our population, how would that translate to just give our listeners an idea of what we're talking about here? Well, the equivalent number proportionally of deaths would be around 7 million. It's about two and a half percent of the population that died in military deaths in the Civil War. And they're actually, that's an undercount of deaths overall, because we have no basis for statistics on civilian deaths and deaths of disease and so forth by civilians as a result of wartime conditions. So it was extraordinary number of deaths. And so what, how did that change the country's view? What was its kind of impact on the way the country thought? Well, at the outset of the Civil War, a couple of things that were important assumptions held by American people. First of all, there was a, a sort of Victorian notion of the good death, which was a domestic death, that you were supposed to die at home surrounded by loved ones who could record your last words, and your last words would give a significant indication of whether you would have an afterlife and whether your relatives would meet you again. Now, of course, the characteristic of death in war was that people died away from home, away from loved ones. And this may sound resonant to certain things right now that are so disturbing as we see people dying alone because of the need to contain the contagion of this disease. And so the expectation of how you die was overturned in significant ways. And throughout the war, um, civilians and soldiers alike tried to come up with improvisations to retain the dignity and the expectation of what death and burial and reverence for the dead should mean. Now, part of this turned out to be that the federal government, which had assumed no responsibility for the deaths of soldiers, they had no formal identification badges, there were no formal identification letters or communications between the military and families, there was no provision for um, identifying bodies and making sure that their grave sites were marked and, and sustained. And this began to seem so inhumane to Americans as people died in droves and their bodies were shoveled into pits and no one knew what had happened to them, that in the course of the war, there evolved a whole series, first of improvisations and then of a very formal set of regulations and procedures that yielded the national cemetery system by the end of the war. And that's where the... um, 
notion of a government having responsibility for its dead and for returning those bodies and for identifying those bodies uh, emerged. And now we cannot imagine, if you think about after Vietnam, when the issue about the missing in action was so um, intense in our society and the demand that bodies be found and returned, it seems unimaginable that only a century and a half ago, there was this kind of neglect of, of that responsibility. This was a huge commitment by the federal government at that time. And in the immediate aftermath of war, the North undertook an effort to go through the South and find all the bodies that had been buried in backyards or little church yards or all the Union soldiers whose graves had not been marked and identified. And over 300,000 Union soldiers were reburied in those new national cemeteries. And so at a time when the federal government had not previously had enormous responsibilities until the war and the waging of the war itself, just the, the effort to create this national cemetery system was a force of federal power and responsibility that was transformative. Well, and I mean, today we see, you know, people dying that, that their relatives can't be with them and they're putting iPads up. And then we saw actually a, ma- a mass grave dug outside of New York City. So, I mean, uh, it, it, it screamed at. <laughs> it was chilling for me to see that because just as Civil War um, Americans couldn't believe that they were treating their dead in the way they found themselves treating their dead at the beginning of the war. That's what I felt. I felt... I thought we figured this out 150 years ago. We didn't, you know, shove bodies into corners because we didn't know what to do with them or throw them in mass graves or uh, all the the kinds of stresses that the system has revealed in, in the past weeks. Once again, challenging us to define what our responsibilities to the dead are and also what it means to be a human being and the kind of respect for those who have come before us and those who have died in our presence, what that requires. It's been startling to me to see some of these. We didn't think that's who we were. I want to share some words, some words that were uttered on December 24th, 1860. Uh, you people speak so lightly of war. You don't know what you're talking about. War is a terrible thing. I know you're brave fighting people, but every day of actual fighting, there are months of marching, exposure, and suffering. More men die in war from sickness than are killed in battle. At best, war is a frightful loss of life and property, and worse, it is still the demoralization of the people. Those words were uttered by a minor Civil War figure by the name of William Tecumseh Sherman, who was on his way out as president of LSU and delivered those remarks to David Boyd, who followed him. I I, I would argue that that's some of the most perceptive words about warfare that has ever been said. It, absolutely. And um, of course, he's the most famously known for saying war is hell and you can't refine it. He understood. And what he said about the dying from disease, he was predicting what happened in the Civil War because twice as many of the military deaths were from disease as from being wounded in battle. One of the things I found after I published this Republic of Suffering is that uh, a lot of military people responded to it very positively. And I hadn't, I hadn't not expected that, but I hadn't entirely understood that they would appreciate the communication of what war means that a book about death represents, that this is what they know so well, and that when you decide to go to war, this is what you're deciding to confront. And so Um, I think Sherman understood it very well. We all need to understand it today. This is the choice you make. And there are times when that choice may be a necessary choice, but it always comes with the kind of cost that is so often not anticipated. Drew, in a piece in the Washington Post that you wrote a few weeks ago, uh, talking about uh, the analogies between the 1860s and this terrible pandemic we're going through, you you, you wrote, I think, that, that in the 19th century, I think I have this right, consciousness of death was supposed to enable a more purposeful life. I'm not mm-hmm. totally sure that happened after the Civil War. Certainly the national cemeteries were a great tribute. Uh, but we're going to have to start thinking of, of more purposeful things after this tragedy of today and after the inequities that it's caused and some way to celebrate not the 
the uh, the dead soldiers, but the people who died and the incredibly courageous healthcare providers. Mm-hmm. One of the striking contrasts I came to recognize as I was working on that book is that in modern America, we tend to want to push death to the margins, not think about it. Um, the idea of dying in your sleep unexpectedly is a great ideal. You know, could we just, there are songs about that. This would have been horrifying to mid-19th century Americans who thought that you needed to prepare for death and that a death that was sudden and took you unaware was one that was likely to be um, uh, not satisfactory because you wouldn't have had time to get ready to meet your maker and, and determine the meaning of your own life. And so I became very sensitized to the notion of I guess the finitude of life and the beauty of that and recognizing how valuable each piece of it is when you think of it as finite. And so we have been given a harsh lesson, a cruel lesson in the um, end to which we all are headed in these last weeks. And uh, we have learned something about ourselves that I think we've tried to forget, which is we're all, all mortal, all of us. That's another part of it. And we all will, at some point or another, hope that we will be treated well as we end those last moments of our lives and that they will be meaningful. Tell us briefly about the Sanitation Commission and its effect. In other words, how much less chance you had if you were a Northern a Union soldier as opposed to if you were a Confederate soldier because of the intervention of the Sanitation Commission? Well, the Sanitary Commission was a voluntary organization that got Lincoln's approval to um, kind of help out the military with the needs of caring for soldiers in medical situations, but also uh, supervising burials and recording the locations of um, dead soldiers and communicating to families. So it was never a government organization, though it had kind of a seal of approval from the government. It was a voluntary organization that did a tremendous amount of philanthropic work with the military. And it was invaluable in, as a supplement to the medical corps of the Northern Army. The South had no such organization. It certainly had people who volunteered as nurses and so forth, but no systematic approach to this. And James, your question also is, reminds me I should underscore something about what I was talking about before. This reburial effort and the National Cemetery effort, that was for Union soldiers only. So often um, as these uh, Union scouts were looking for bodies in the South, they might find a Confederate soldier right next to a Union soldier, a dead one, and just leave the Confederate soldier there and rebury the Union one. And this aroused a lot of resentment in the South and led to a movement on the part of white Southern women to themselves voluntarily put together organizations that could rebury Confederate soldiers, which they did quite successfully, especially around Richmond and the battlefields and killing grounds in Virginia, not far from where you are right now. But these these Southern women's organizations also became a kind of hotbed for the birth of the lost cause and the hell no, we're not defeated yet mentality that the white South, much of the white South embraced in the years after the war. So the burial program of the North was both pathbreaking in terms of the values of our nation toward, and its commitment towards the war dead, but it was also a polarizing effort in the um, aftermath of the Civil War. But what I love about this, it was citizens doing it. it, it people, yes. uh, you know, famously Mother Bickerdike rode aside Sherman at the uh, review of the Grand Armies of the Republic. Mm-hmm. You know? I mean, mm-hmm. it, these guys knew who they were. <laughs> and that's also a, a part of having to invent Um, responses to a circumstance that no one ever imagined. And so this notion of improvisation in face of mass death and the involvement of citizens and civilians just trying to figure out what to do, it's just very admirable. It's a kind of entrepreneurship, I guess, of of a 19th century variety. Wow. Uh, Drew, before we let you go, and we cannot tell you how much we appreciate it, let me just circle back to one question on on higher education again, and and that is we're talking about some colleges probably won't be able to reopen the small 
less well endowed schools, public institutions are going to have some problems. We have a student debt crisis already. Uh, you know, trillions of dollars of student debt. This is going to create, you know, maybe a whole generation that is going to be uh, hit by this. Well, Al, there are a couple of things that really trouble me here. One is um, there's reporting that a lot of students who have been thinking about going to college in the fall, particularly students of modest income and minority students, are now thinking, oh, I don't know how to figure this out. I don't know if they're going to be online or what. And so I think there's going to be a big melt in the number of students who are going to show up for higher education. And that's very worrying for our country. And it's also worrying for um, our notions of uh, social mobility through education, because disproportionately the students who are going to give up will be um, minority and and um, students of limited means. The other thing that we've seen so vividly over these past weeks, and you've probably seen this in the classes you're teaching, is when you send everybody home, that's not treating everyone equitably exactly, because some people can go home and have a room in which they can do their Zoom learning. They have privacy and quiet in which to study. Others go to small living quarters where it's almost impossible for them to continue with their education. They have very differential access to um, broadband, to computers. And so some of the inequalities in higher education have just been cast into even more vivid relief by uh, these circumstances. And I think we as a nation have to as we ask so many questions of ourselves in the aftermath of this pandemic, we have to ask ourselves about access to higher education and how it can be more equitable than it has been in the past. Well, it's going to be a, a, a great challenge, but boy, you have really edified us today. Drew Faust, we cannot thank you enough. And any of you listeners out there who have not read The Republic of Suffering, please go wherever you go. If there's a bookstore that's still keeping it <laughs> open or Amazon, it is one of the great books ever written. Uh, it's not the most uplifting book, uh, really, but uh, in some ways uh, it really is. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, now my daughter's 25 and she, she just says her favorite book ever. I mean, and she's very literary and very critical. And she, she just said that on her own. I think this was way before I even thought about ever been of the you. And every time that somebody dies, she rereads it. it, it Oh, my goodness. Well, I'm touched and honored by that. Well, uh, you know, you have just, uh, I mean, for a simple LSU and Wake Forest guy, you have really, <laughs> you have really elevated us today. <laughs> Drew Faust, thank you so much, and stay safe. Thanks to both of you. Hey, James, our next guest is a combination of Grantland Rice and Ernest Hemingway. John Feinstein has written more books than many people have read. Thousands of columns broadcast every sport short of ping pong. John, thank you for being with us. Uh, and I want to ask you, is our long national nightmare without sports? We can't turn on ESPN. We can't go watch the defending champion Washington Nationals. It's, it seems so much longer than seven weeks. Do you think it's about to end? Will we have a baseball season this year? You know, Al, I wish I was bright enough to be able to answer that question because uh, then uh, they could use me at the Trump White House as a, a rare teller of truth if I actually knew the answer to that. Um, but You wouldn't fit in if you did that. <laughs> but I, 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 I think the answer is we don't know. I know that... Uh, sports, all the sports, baseball, basketball, hockey, football, pro in college, uh, golf, tennis, they're all making plans to start again because to some degree they have to because they have to have the, the logistics in place if and when they can begin. The problem is none of us really knows when it's going to be safe. Now, golf is planning to come back on June 11th and play four weeks with no spectators. Whether that can work will tell us a lot about what's going to happen next going forward. I think it's going to be a while before we can go back to having packed stadiums, before we can go back to having packed arenas, uh, before we can just pretend social distancing uh, isn't part of our lives anymore. I, I, I have no timetable on that. I'm not sure the experts do. But the one thing I, I will say, and, and James, I know this this – such as close to your heart is football is going to be one of the toughest sports to start again 
because it's not like golf where you got three guys walking down a fairway separated by as much distance as they need to. There's there's no social distancing when you're playing football or basketball for that matter. Well, basketball, I mean, I'm going I'm to turn to James on football in, in just a second. But, John, basketball, for the NBA, for instance, you know, might be the easiest in the sense that on, on a scale there's fewer players that have to isolate them, whether it's in Vegas or Arizona or, uh, or California, test them and mask. And, um, you know, it seems to me that, that – that, and, and they can get a, a good television audience. Baseball strikes me as harder. It's bigger. Uh, and I, as I understand it, baseball depends disproportionately on the revenue they get from attendance. And playing without crowds is going to create a huge financial strain. There's no question. I mean, football, could, both in college and pro, could almost survive financially without spectators as long as they're getting the TV dollars. That's one reason why early on in all this, uh, when there was first discussion of not playing an NCAA basketball tournament, uh, I was convinced they would play it uh, with, in empty arenas because the TV money is so huge. Uh, but, of course, it, when we got to the point where everything had to shut down, that wasn't a possibility. But I, I do think that uh, baseball needs spectators financially more than some of the other sports. But I do think that, it, again, it's not a contact sport except, except for the occasional play at second base or at home. Uh, and if even if you, if you had to, if you're playing in empty stadiums, you can, you can put the players all over the play, stadium. You don't have to have them all in the dugout. So in that sense, they could social distance, do social distancing. But I do agree with you that financially it will be difficult. That said, Al, half a season – with some spectators or no spectators and TV revenue is still more than no season at all. Oh boy, if it's safe, I'll take it in a minute. James. Yeah. I, I, I John, I couldn't agree more. And I, if there's anything on television that is contemporary and somebody's chasing it, throwing it, shooting it, catching it, hitting it, I'm going to watch it right now. Shit. If I watch LSU and Clemson in the nationals playoffs one more time, I'm going to throw up. <laughs> I mean, how many times can I watch that? Funny you say that, James, because I said to somebody recently that I never thought a time would come when I, I couldn't bear the thought of seeing one more minute of the Kentucky Duke game in 1992 oh. when Christian Leighton hit that <laughs> shot. But after it was on television for the 327th time last week, I, I think I hit my limit. I know what you're saying. <laughs> the, the, one of the problems, is, that's what we need testing ramped up. Because if, if you say, and of course, testing is going to be, you have to test everybody every day. And if, if the story becomes these multi-million dollar athletes are getting tested, why people in emergency rooms can't get a test, it, it's going to, ha- they got to solve that and they got to figure that out pretty quickly. And I mean, basically baseball, NBA, particularly the NFL, they can think of something, the bigger college programs, you know, the Duke basketballs, the, the, the Clemson footballs of the world, they, they, they're, they're going to be fine. But think of all of the, the smaller you know, colleges that don't have that kind of revenue, the athletic department is going to be decimated by this stuff. I mean, it, the impact will be pretty profound. Yeah, there, there's no question. And obviously the bigger, biggest money in college sports is in the, the Power Five football conferences and the money they make from their TV contracts, which is why uh, if there's a way for them to play in the fall – Without, in empty stadiums, they will, James. But, of course, the bigger question is how do you justify bringing 100 football players to campus or 15 basketball players or soccer players or any other athlete when classes aren't being held? I mean, we, we still do cling to this notion that these guys are, are going to college in some way, shape, or form. And so I, that's going to be the big problem is, is getting – uh, somebody to say, okay, look, we're just going to be honest about this. We, we need the football revenue. We're bringing the, the kids from football back. We're going to test them. We're going to play in empty stadiums because we need the TV revenue. I don't know if the NCAA would ever step up and say that because then the, the entire myth that they try to create of the so-called student athlete um, would, would, would go away. Uh, as it should. It should have gone away years ago anyway. But the other point you bring up that I think is very significant isn't just the idea of constantly testing millionaire athletes while, you know, hospitals don't have enough tests, but the idea of testing them for the purpose of seeing to it that billionaire owners continue to make money. 
I, I, I would think that would be a big issue. Why are you starting baseball? Well, because the owners want the revenue. You know, but John, at some level, because I want to watch it. I don't give a I, Yeah, I, you know, at some level, I want to watch it. I understand amateurism and that. But I, I just, we all do. You know, in, in, let me say this. We, we had 14 drafted, which tied a record. Of the 14, nine have a degree and six were juniors. All right. Now, I know no one is ever going to say that because we have to be declared a, a football factory. But I'll I just make that point. But I, 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 nine I, plus I, six equals yeah, 14. Yeah, I was I'm just saying that. nine had degrees and <laughs> six were juniors. So left, apparently John. some juniors even got their degrees is the point I'm making. If you have, if you have 14 minus six is eight. If they said we're all juniors, I'm saying that's a pretty impressive statistic when you went out of the 14, six were juniors. But but I, I digress because I don't want to get off the talking point. Yeah, there. because I think John, but I think John's larger point that 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 yeah, I want to watch too. A lot of people want to watch. They players want to play, whether it's professional or college. But until we have, you know, you can't just let those people of privilege, particularly the people who are getting a lot of money, be able to come back to a semi-normal life while others are not. Uh, I think that's a huge political and social problem. And uh, if we make the kind of progress that we should make over the next three months, if we had a different administration, then I think that's feasible. But I'm not sure it is uh, short of that. I, I just, I, I disagree. I, I, and, and because people need this. The, the product that they're putting out right now, I, you know, yeah, Robert Kraft will make money. Or, 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 you know, the, the administrators at, at big time football schools will get paid. But people need this. This is not the time to have this larger discussion. I don't I don't disagree that people need it. And we got to get John Feinstein in on this. That's why he's our guest. But I don't think it's OK for Robert Kraft to do it if they can't get proper uh, equipment at Mass General. I, I, I was sitting back and not saying anything because I was enjoying the debate. Um, and we should say, in fairness, that Robert Kraft sent his plane to Europe uh, to pick up tests for places like Mass General. Um, and, and, you know, good for him for doing that. And, and I'll also say, and I'm no big supporter of the NFL, good for them for raising $100 million during the course of the NFL draft through contributions and matching funds last week. Um, so I, I, I think we give credit where credit is due in this cir circumstance. But I feel a little bit like Billy Martin right now because I think you're both right on different levels. I, I mean, do we do we need sports back, James? Yes, but need is it need in capital letters or is it need in small letters? I mean, you and I and Al would all like to be watching baseball right now and golf right now and gearing up for the French Open in Wimbledon or whatever. Um, but uh, but it, it, the world doesn't stop without sports. I mean, the world has stopped, period. But it, the world goes on, will go on without sports for as long as necessary. On the other hand, I do think that anything we do right now, as long as it's safe, those are the key five words, to return normalcy to everyone's lives and to get more people working, obviously, because forget about the athletes for a minute with, you know, with the stadiums closed, the, the vendors are out of work. The concessionaires are out of work. The people who sell tickets are out of work. The ushers are out of work. Um, a lot of people who need the money a lot more than the athletes and the, and the coaches are out of work right now because there's no sports. So I think there is justification for getting sports back as soon as you can do it in a safe way. But I also think you got to take into consideration what the desperate needs are as opposed to what the needs are. I invoke the name of one minor historical figure in support of my point of view, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He's, he's, not, he's, a, he's a major historical. Uh, I agree. That's, I'm, making, I'm being sarcastic. And he said, you gotta keep, you got to keep playing baseball. you got to keep playing. But it wasn't unsafe to play baseball, James, during World War II. See, that's, that's the difference. I, you know, when, when, when Pete Rodell allowed the NFL to play the Sunday after John F. Kennedy was, was shot, and which he said was his biggest mistake, that was just appalling on, on a cultural level, on a moral level. And when, when sports shut down after 9-11, it was absolutely the right thing to do. And when it came back, it was absolutely the right thing to do. There are no absolutes here because we don't have absolute answers yet to when it's going to be completely safe. 
I, I, but you can reduce the risk. Yeah. You know, John, we, we have talked a lot about uh, football and pro sports, you know, as we all do. But but let you, you and I are both college basketball fanatics. Uh, you know, it's I don't know. You, we're not sure there'll be a college basketball season. Maybe they can do it with with television, but they can't do it if those campuses aren't coming back. Uh, and I would think in basketball, particularly, I'm talking the high end now. Some of these kids are going to say, "Hey, you know, I'm going, I'm going G League. I'm going, you know, I'm not going to bother with this college stuff." I think it may have a real impact on even the Dukes and Kentuckys. You know, uh, this is a separate issue. I, the one and done is going to go away in about another two years when the, when the next union contract comes up, Al, and it's going to go back to the way it used to be when kids could jump straight from high school if they wanted. Uh, I would love to see them go to the baseball rule where if you decide to go to college, you can't be drafted for three years. I'm not sure you get that through legally, but baseball has been able to do that. Um, but I, so I don't think that's going to be an impact, but here's where the impact is going to come. And it's not in an area that you or, or James care about that much, but where I do the smaller schools and James brought that up briefly. They, the smaller schools, the ones that don't have power football, attached to them their almost their entire income base athletically comes from their basketball programs from t- television because they are on television from uh selling tickets from marketing licensing things like that you take that away if you were taken away for an entire season it'd be a disaster now what i'm hearing as i said from coaches is they're being told if there's no nobody on campus first semester, there'll be no basketball. But if they get basketball back second semester and can play some or most of the season, then they'll be okay. But as you said, Al, we just don't know. We just don't know. And it, ultimately, the mid-major programs will be affected more in many different ways because it'll affect non-revenue programs more than the, than the power programs. Well, I would just point out, James and I are affiliated with American University in this podcast. Uh, so we have our, our favorite mid-major team. And there's no one who knows more about that league than you, John Feinstein. But that's a really good point. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll just have to see how it evolves. Exactly. That's exactly right. I, I, we, we have to see how it evolves. And um, American had a really good year last year. Mike Brennan's a terrific coach. And, and I know they want to come back and take another crack at the Patriot League this year. And uh, as do many other mid-major programs. I mean, what would college basketball be, just for one second, without UMBC beating Virginia oh. and upsets like that in, in, in the NCAA? It, it would be completely different. Right, right, right. Uh, and, and just to just so you know, one of the things I love about the March basketball is playing, like the Missouri Valley Conference championship game. You know, to get a seed in the tournament. I mean, those athletes are trying as hard as as, as you can find in, in, you know, in the, in the in the final four. And when there's something on the line, I kind of I like to to joust around a little bit. But and just think of how many people go to basketball games and how many referees. I mean, think of how many high school games they are and what goes on. And all of this is like gone, man. No, and, and and that's exactly what I wrote about in my last book, James. The back roads to March came out cleverly enough in March uh, about teams from the Missouri Valley and the fact that Loyola of Chicago two years ago would not have been in the NCAA tournament if they had lost that championship game in the Missouri Valley because the committee would not have taken them as an at large. Instead, they're an 11 seed and they go to the Final Four. And that's what makes the tournament so special, stories like that. And you guys both remember Sister Jean and what a star she became almost overnight during that period. But you're right, James, that when you go to those, as we call them, the one-bid league tournaments, where kids are playing to keep their basketball careers alive, because none of them are going to be in the NBA. Very few of them are going to go play overseas. Most of them are going to go on and do something beyond basketball uh, when they're done, when they graduate, as most of the seniors do. Um, and so they're, they're playing for, for something, to keep something going that uh, they started doing when they were little kids. And one of the best lines I ever heard on that was from a, uh, an Army football player named Anthony Noto, who said the, the hardest thing in life is not getting up to face the battle. It's getting up with no battle to face. And that's what each of those kids in those one-bid one leagues are facing in those conference tournaments you just mentioned. 
Because if I'm watching the ACC tournament or the Big Ten tournament or even the SEC tournament, they're not. If the, most of the teams know if they're getting in or getting out. Yeah. It's going to be in the tournament, out tournament. So, you know, if Carolina beats Duke, that's great. The Carolina kids have fun. As soon as the tournament starts, who cares? Till you play in a tournament. But in those, those kind of things, these kids are playing, you know, they've been there for four years and they're playing their last game, maybe. That's exactly right. And you can just feel it come through the television screen. That's you know, I love that stuff. That's no? exactly right. And uh, when Mike Bray was the coach at Delaware before he went to Notre Dame, he said to me once, you know, for teams like ours, getting into the NCAA tournament is like a big time team getting into the Final Four. And to win a game or two, is like winning the national championship. And, and that's that's what it means to those kids. And, and and you see the emotion, you see the emotion on both sides, the winners and the losers, especially when a championship game goes down to the buzzer. And it, it's heart-wrenching to watch the losers because as you, in many cases, their basketball careers just ended. And I'll give you one small example real quickly. When basketball was shut down uh, this year, it was right before the America East championship game, the kind of championship game you're talking about, James. And it was between Vermont, which goes to the tournament every other year at worst, and Hartford. And Hartford had never been, still has never been in the NCAA tournament. And th th these kids had won on the road to get to the championship game and really thought this was going to be their moment in time that they were going to win at Vermont. They'd won at Vermont in the past. They were going to do it, and they were going to make history for themselves and their school, and they never got the chance to play that game. That's a heck of a lot more heartbreaking than, as you said, James, Duke getting a chance to play to win the ACC tournament for the 19th time. Well, that's really well well put, John. I want to, you, you know, you have been incredibly generous with your time. You've written 36 books. What's the 37th? Well, actually, I've written 42, Al, if you include all my fiction books. My my website isn't updated, so that's why you said 36. Um, but the, the book I'm working on right now uh, is on race in sports and how it is still the elephant in the room, not only in sports, but in our society. And we saw it during the anthem protest. We saw it in the visceral response from so many white people to Colin Kaepernick, including the president of the United States, who said that he should leave the country. Um, and I, I, Lamar Jackson it has, is my way into this book. I've been looking for a way to get into a book on this topic for years. But you remember, Lamar, all the white scouts and pundits and general managers said he should be a wide receiver or uh, a running back because he's fast and because he's African-American. And, of course, we know what happens. An African-American general manager took him with the last pick of the first round after four white quarterbacks had gone in the top ten. And where is he now? He's the MVP of the National Football League. And Patrick Mahomes is another example. But it's, I've only just started the research, but it's already been fascinating for me. Well, that's going to be a great book. I mean, it wasn't too long ago there were no black quarterbacks. Uh, and now, I don't know. How, but So we're making progress, but – you're right. It's an issue that never goes away. We're making progress, but, but you guys both live in Washington. You remember the whole Donovan McNabb, Mike Shanahan incident when he benched him and he gave three excuses on three different occasions. One, he didn't know the two-minute offense. Two, he wasn't in shape. And three, they had to cut the playbook in half for him. If that wasn't racial stereotyping, and that's just 10 years ago, I don't know what is, but you're right. Yeah, I, if it was that bad, why did he win so many games in Philadelphia? But Exactly. Um, in any event, I, I'm going to give you another name, J.R. Richard. Yes, yes. Okay. He he was in in his state. He was lazy. You know, he's a quitter. Of course, he died of a stroke. Right. But all of the the in Houston, what they the the venom that they and it was so racist. It was like unbelievable. Yep, you're right, and that's a very good point. And it was a every kind of stereotype you could do. He, he, I mean, he's a real example, you know. I mean, there's a million. I'm unfortunately, you, you ain't gonna run out of examples, but he just comes to mind. Well, and I'll give you one. One of the guys I have already interviewed is Tony Dungy, uh, first African American coach to win a Super Bowl. He was an all, all Big Ten quarterback at Minnesota, and this is in the days when the draft went 12 rounds and wasn't picked by anybody, and eventually caught on with the Pittsburgh Steelers as a defensive back. They wouldn't even consider back then giving a black quarterback an opportunity. Wow. Well, I this is going to be a fabulous book, John Feinstein. I have one. I have one final question. 
and that is who should weigh Taurus tire? No, no, because I, <laughs> I don't I don't think it matters a whole lot, unfortunately. But you but but you can tell me later. But but having won the World Series, Steven Strasburg, the MVP, will you now say maybe, maybe those of us that thought they were wrong were shutting down? No, 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 no. no. And let me just emphasize, no, they were wrong to do what they did in 2012. When they realized they were good, when they first made the plan, Al, they thought they were, weren't going to be good yet, that they were a year away. By June, you knew they were good, that they had a great chance to win the East, which they did. And what they should have done was adapted and stretched out his innings, sit him down in August, start him on seven days rest. I'm not saying pitch him more innings. I'm saying stretch out the innings so that he would have been available in October and not available in August. And they might have won a World Series that year. They had the best record in baseball that year when this regular season ended. And they gave up the chance to win a World Series because Mike Rizzo was intimidated by Scott Boris. And it was a mistake then. If they won the next seven World Series, it would still be a mistake. If they never won a World Series, it would still be a mistake. So let me just say in my most subtle fashion, the answer to your question is no. I feel 100% the way I felt back then. And I know I was in the minority in the Washington media because, A, everybody buys into Rizzo, and, B, Tom Boswell buys into Rizzo, and Tom Boswell sets the tone for the baseball media here. Well, I think you're right, probably, but there have been one downside to that, and that is that it would have detracted a little bit, just a little bit, from the most incredible season and World Series victory any of us have ever seen. So I don't know. That's a trade. Yeah, well, you weren't alive in 1969? Yeah, this was better. I mean, they were never. Not better. Whole season. I'm sorry. You're wrong. James, you know this is you're wrong. The greatest they didn't have to beat the Dodgers at Dodger Stadium. I, 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 first of all, look at look at how postseason was. And the Mets were actually, you know, much more of a favorite going into the postseason than the Nationals were. And how many how many deciding games did they have? Wrong, wrong, wrong. <laughs> the Orioles won 109 games that year. <laughs> no, don't don't question me on this one. This one I know better than no. Both of but you. together we we're right. The Orioles, the Orioles won Game One. Go back and read the New York papers. The World Series. Was All over. I will say is that that by yourself you're 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 the best. Together we're right on this one. But John Feinstein, I want to ask one, I want to ask one favor, and that no, is you're not, when that's that, okay. that, I love you both anyway. When that next book comes out on race and sports, will you come on as a guest if we're still lucky enough to be around? Absolutely, 100%. You know that. Terrific. John, thank you. You've been great, as always. So, Albert. Go ahead, James. So, Ohio 3 is a is, is represented by a member in good standing of, of, of the Black Caucus, Joyce Beatty. All right? This is a – this is Columbus. All right? This is very – it's a very, very liberal – District in Ohio, I think it's like a plus 19 Democratic performance. Highly educated. There are other colleges in there also. And uh, Joyce is the Pelosi, Clyburn, Cedric Richmond, I don't know. You know what I mean? Hakeem Jeffers, Democrat. Yep. And she was challenged aggressively by a Justice Democrat. The, you know, ultimate kind of Bernie bro. Left wing. And you would think if there's any place outside of the coast where they should do well, it's right here. And it and it came out like 69-31. And yet when Politico, in the morning take, it says Beatty outlast challenger. You beat somebody by 40 points, you don't outlast them, you trounce them. And, and that's just so part of the mentality that somehow or another, the, the, there's a fight for the soul of the Democratic Party going out there. There's no such thing. That the actual voting Democrats have decided what they want to do. Yeah. You know. Well, this is what they, they, they're still doing, James. The other day, Justice Democrats, another group, uh, demanded that Joe Biden remove Larry Summers from any group of people he talks to or consults. And I and I wrote this removing I mean, whatever you think of Larry Summers uh, persona, there is no one in economic matters more experienced or smarter uh, than Larry Summers and removing Larry Summers as a consultant when you're going through the worst economic crisis since 
the 1930s really is like benching Michael Jordan uh, in the championship game. I mean, they just uh, they 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 have a death wish, right. and it's just it's it's uh, they they haven't gotten over it. That, that they have now. They've started a super PAC. All right, I, I want to say Senator Sanders is, has been exemplary. He is, and I think he genuinely believes that. I think he genuinely likes Vice President Biden. I think he's genuinely horrified by President Trump. I, 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 I have given him nothing but pristine motives here. Some of his people start a super PAC. With the, the purpose of the super PAC is to push Biden to the left. The purpose of everything we do is to win the election, right? It would be like forming a group in, in 1944 to try to wrestle the Democratic nomination from, well, Frank, Frank be Franklin Roosevelt, all right, or let's just say late 45. So, so Harry Truman, would, everything is to win the war. It's to win the war. This is what, what the ideological battle is not going on right now. There's a giant political battle with a career criminal who's causing people left and right by, by his inane inaction and incompetence to die. We got to get him out of there. Now, pronto, nothing else matters. Nothing. Well, I. this is one, unlike some of the sports issues, that we totally agree on. And I would love to see a debate with one of those people between what is the real existential threat? Uh, public option, expansion of Obamacare versus Medicare for all, or reelecting or not reelecting Donald Trump. If they think, if they think that in any way is a debatable issue, uh, then uh, they have totally lost their senses because it's not. It's, I, 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 something is wrong with people. I, and, you know, they're probably, I got news, they're probably going to do very well a, a, after this election. I mean, I, I good chance the country is going to take a, going to move more in their direction and away from it. But in order to, to have a country, we got to do one thing. We got to not just have Joe Biden win, we got to get him to win by the biggest margin that is possible. We have to eradicate this virus, this, this horrible political virus that's infected this country. And there's a vaccine, and that vaccine is called a big win. Well, uh, as I say, on this one, we are absolutely on the same page. Uh, James, before we go, first of all, Drew Faust and John Feinstein, uh, you know, they, they, are, they are completely different, except they are both the greatest experts in their fields. Uh, of anyone we get on, and they both are great guests. We are so appreciative. Um, I got several emails that said, you know, tell us just, you know, for a, a minute or two at the end, kind of tell us what you're doing uh, when you're hunkered down out in uh, uh, the Shenandoah or in Washington. Uh, and I try to read a couple books a week, like we all do. Uh, I spend more time reading the Times and Washington Post than ever in venues like Vox, and especially The Atlantic. The Atlantic has done more fabulous stuff uh, during these last uh, couple months uh, than I can ever remember. And, every, and James, we talked about this. Every night, uh, I try to watch an old movie, 40 years of age at least, and it's no surprise that there are things like The Godfather 1 and 2 or Big Lebowski, but go back and watch On the Waterfront. Boy, it is a great movie. Or the one you recommended, Downfall. Uh, and finally, I love the ESPN series, The Last Dance Portrait of Michael Jordan, Six More to Go. You see a side of Michael Jordan you didn't know. And my favorite series, Homeland, the finale was so compelling, it made up for a less than stellar last few seasons. James, you're probably more highbrow. Uh, let's see here. I got uh, the new The Splendid and the Vile, and the new uh, Eric Larson book. I got The Russian Revolution by Shin Keegan. On the origins of war, Donald Kagan, you get to kind of uh, drift away. I am also reading Enigma, to Robert Harris's uh, the fiction book, but I'm, I'm moving around a lot. But, you know, what I do a lot is just try to think about politics and, you know, how to, you know, just try to occupy my mind as to what we can do to, to, to get this thing moving in the direction we need it. You know, I'm a Louisiana guy, so I cook a lot. I'm very fortunate I'm out here in the Shenandoah Valley and, uh, I have some help, so it, it, you know, and I just sit and read and stew and read some more and talk to people like you on the telephone and just love doing this show and had so much fun today. I mean, I, I, I look forward to this hour as much as I look forward to anything my whole week. Yeah, me too. Whatever, well, you're right. I mean, I, you know, I wouldn't go argue with Dr. Foss. I'd argue with, with, with Feinstein. <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't even think I don't think John would argue with Drew Faust. No, I don't think so either. <laughs> no, it was it was a it was a great hour, and uh, we'll you know stay safe. Uh, you know we'll talk early and often. Uh, and uh, oh, I got something for for listeners: the Bulwark. Go to that yeah, site. Yeah, yeah. It is my favorite, and it's by a bunch of, it's kind of William Crystal. It's a real, real anti-Trump, but man, they are good and they are mean, which I really love. You you watch that that February 7th piece and then tell me how Trump's going to win this election. Just go bulwark February 7th. Everybody go to it February 7th. James, be safe. Uh, we'll, you and I'll talk probably later today, and we'll talk to all of you a week from today. Uh, Everybody be safe out there, and please subscribe and review the podcast on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcast. For James, I'm Al Hunt again. We'll talk to you next week. Stay safe.